Hello and welcome to Otten Math. In this edition of Otten Math, we're going to uh, tackle some problems uh, on inscribed and circumscribed polygons. All right, so let's get started. Problem number 23 from the textbook uh, says, are the vertices of each figure concyclic always, sometimes, or never? So we have a bunch of different uh, figures. We're going to determine whether or not they're always, sometimes, or never concyclic. All right, so the first one is going to be a rectangle. And we know that a rectangle is always going to be concyclic. Uh, meaning that the if I were to create a circle, I can create a circle uh, in which that circle touches all of the vertices of the rectangle. And how do we know that's true? Well, remember we explained in Theorem 94 that we have uh, four right angles in a rectangle, and I can create two diameters right uh, from each of the vertices. I know those diameters cut the circle in half. And I know that these angles, these corresponding angles, <clears throat> are going to create a semicircle. All right, so the vertices of each figure, this particular figure, rectangle, will always be uh, concyclic. So just to kind of uh, backtrack again, we can recall Theorem 93 from our lesson. And Theorem 93, um, if you remember, talks about talks about a quadrilateral inscribed in a circle, its opposite angles are going to be supplementary. And remember, we proved that uh, by saying that these inscribed angles uh, cut out a, an arc length, both of them combined, um, an arc measure that was equal to 360 degrees. So that angle D and B must be supplementary to each other. So when we consider these quadrilaterals, we, the thing that we want to ask ourselves in most cases is whether or not the opposite angles are going to be supplementary. And if they are, then we know that that figure uh, can be inscribed in the circle and that the circle is concyclic or the figure is uh, concyclic to that circle. All right, so we talked about uh, the first one was a rectangle and we said always because opposite angles are supplementary. Uh, next is a parallelogram. And the answer to that is going to be sometimes um, if the opposite angles are supplementary, uh, and that uh, is the case in a rectangle and a square. So if it's a rectangle or a square, and we know the opposite angles are supplementary, then we know that that parallelogram is going to be concyclic to uh, the circle. So we're going to say sometimes in this case. So we have a rectangle, which is always, parallelogram, which is sometimes, a rhombus. So let's think about this. A rhombus, a rhombus the opposite angles of a rhombus are going to be supplementary when that rhombus is going to be a square. So the answer to this is going to be sometimes, so the opposite angles are supplementary when that rhombus is a square. Next figure is an isosceles trapezoid, so always, sometimes, or never. And the answer to this is going to be never because the opposite angles are not supplementary. If I had an isosceles trapezoid, then I could say that the opposite angles are going to be supplementary, uh, but if the trapezoid is not isosceles, then it does not ever uh, is not ever concyclic to the circle. Okay, next question E. An equi uh, equilateral polygon uh, is going to be concyclic always, sometimes, or never. In this case, we're going to say it's sometimes. Now, let's talk about two different cases. Uh, we'll have case number one on the left, where I have an equilateral polygon, which is a rhombus, and that rhombus is not going to be equiangular. And then I have a hexagon on the right uh, where the figure ends up being, I've drawn it uh, to be an equiangular and equilateral polygon. So in some cases, as in the rhombus, the equilateral polygon is not going to be concyclic. But in other cases, the equilateral polygon where I have an equiangular polygon, uh, that figure will be concyclic. All right, next let's talk about uh, equiangular polygons. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this figure here, the hexagon, to demonstrate how we can construe that at least the hexagon in this case uh, is going to be always concyclic. That would be a regular hexagon. All right, so I've taken the hexagon, and it's a regular hexagon. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of map out the angles and show you why all these points here are going to be points on the circle. So first, the measure of the interior angles 
is going to be equal to uh, the sides minus 2 times 180 divided by the number of sides. I have 6 sides, uh, minus 2 gives me 4 times 180, 720 divided by 6 again leaves me with 120 degrees for each of the uh, interior angles of the hexagon. So 120, 120, 120, 120, 120, and 120. Alright, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw, uh, I'm going to take that uh, hexagon, I'm going to slice it in half, and I'm going to do that a couple times. But let's just do that uh, this once just for the sake of example. And as I do that, what happens is I divide the hexagon into two symmetrical uh, isosceles trapezoids. And why are they isosceles trapezoids? Well, if the upper base angles are congruent or the lower base angles are congruent, uh, then I know uh, this is an isosceles trapezoid. Also, if the uh, legs are congruent, then I have an isosceles trapezoid by definition. So I have two identical isosceles trapezoids, and I know that these angles here, uh, ACB, or ACD and DC, we'll call this E, are going to be congruent at 60 degrees. So essentially I've bisected the, uh, the angles or the vertices uh, of the hexagon. And then I'm going to do that again uh, two more times, so I uh, slice the hexagon in half, uh, and what I'm really doing is I'm creating three different diameters for the circle. But as I do this, I'm creating a host, uh, or at least six, uh, 60, 60, 60, or equiangular, equilateral triangles that all have congruent sides. So now I started with a hexagon, regular hexagon, where all the sides were congruent. Then I created one diameter. I sliced the hexagon in half, <clears throat> and then I sliced it in half again and again, so B, E, AD and uh, CF all bisecting or splitting the hexagon in half. And as I do that, I create <clears throat> uh, a set of 60, 60, 60 triangles. And as I do that, I create an equilateral, equiangular, uh, set of equiangular, equilateral triangles. So now BO is congruent to OA, is congruent to OF, is congruent to OE, is congruent to OD, is congruent to OC. And as a result, what I end up doing is I show that uh, this hexagon has its vertices on the circle, because as you recall, the definition of a circle is a set of all points that are equidistant from a fixed point called the center. And we've just determined that this point O is going to be the center, because the distances OA, OB, OC, OD, OE, and OF are all the same. I've just created a circle as I connect those points, leaving O as the center of the circle. All right, so this is one way to show that an equiangular polygon is going to be always concyclic. What you can do is set up your set of points and then create a set of congruent uh, triangles such that you figure out that the radius or the distance from the center or from a point, uh, the center of the polygon, to the vertices are all going to be equal. Okay, moving on. Problem number 24. A right triangle has legs measuring 5 and 12. Find the ratio of the area of the inscribed circle to the area of the circumscribed circle. So I have the inscribed circle here. The circumscribed circle goes about or around the triangle. So I know that AB is 5, BC is 12, and AC is 13. Alright, so what can we do with this information? Alright, so what we're going to do is we're going to identify if uh, AB is 5. I'm going to identify this point here as D. I know that BD is, I'm going to establish that as X. And I'm going to say that uh, BE is also X. And what I've done is I've created a square in BDFE uh, where all the side lengths are going to be X. So I'm going to use my walk around um, problem knowledge in order to solve for the value of X. So if O or DB is X, BE is X, and AB is 5, I can say that AD is going to be 5 minus X. Then I'm going to use a two-tangent theorem. If AD is equal to X, let's say this is AG is equal to 5 minus X, and GE is equal to 13 minus 5 minus X, which is equal to 8 plus X. And if GC is equal to 8 plus X, then CE is also equal to 8 plus X. So remember the two tangent theorem says that if I have two tangents that originate from the same point to the same circle, 
then those tangents are going to be congruent in length. So again, uh, db is x, ad is going to be ab, which is 5 units, minus x. ag, using the two tangent theorem, must also be 5 minus x. I know that ac is 13, so ac is 13 minus ag, or 5 minus x, which leaves me with 8 plus x. By the two tangent theorem, I know that gc and ce are congruent, so both gc and ce are 8 plus x. All right, well, first I'm going to start with it. Let's, we're trying to fi find out what the ratio of the area of the inscribed circle is to the area of the circumscribed circle. So first thing we need to do uh, is we're going to use the knowledge we have about the parameter of the triangle ABC. Well, I know it's 5 plus 12 plus 13, which leaves me with a value of 30. Then I'm going to use the values <clears throat> that I've just determined, 5 minus x, 5 minus x, 8 plus x, 8 plus x, and then 2x, uh, and I'm going to set those equal to the parameter, which is equal to 30. So I'm going to simplify combined like terms, and I end up with 10 plus 16 plus 2x is equal to 30, or x is equal to 2. So if x is equal to 2, then the radius of the smaller circle is also going to be equal to 2. So db and fe are congruent. fe is a uh, radius of circle f. So I know that the radius of the smaller circle is 2. I can also determine that the radius of the larger circle is going to be half of the diameter, right? Because I have this right angle here. I have a 5, 12, 13 triangle. I have this right angle here. So AC, we could say this is AHC, arc AHC is 180 degrees. So I know that angle ABC is 90 degrees. Or because ABC is 90 degrees, I know that arc AHC is 180 degrees. So AC, segment AC, constitutes my diameter. It also constitutes the hypotenuse, which is equal to 13. So I know that the radius is half that, or 6 and a half. Well, what I'm trying to find is the relative ratio of areas. And the area is pi r squared. So the pi value is irre irrelevant in, uh, in establishing the ratio because it uh, reduces to 1 as you establish the ratio. ratio. So now I'm left with r squared to r squared, or 42.25 to 4, so 6.5 squared to 2 squared. And then I want to use integers or whole numbers in order to establish a ratio, so I rewrite this as 169 to 16, and that's your answer. All right, moving on to number 25. I believe we have two more problems to do. Given circle P is inscribed in trapezoid W, X, Y, Z, angles W and X are right angles, as I've indicated. The radius of the circle P is 5. Y, Z, as I've indicated, is 14. Find the perimeter of W, X, Y, Z. All right, so let's mark up the diagram. Well, I know that if the radius of circle P is 5, then this point we'll call W, G, and G, X are going to be 5, and X, Q will be 5, and P, Q will also be 5. So I have two squares <clears throat> in W, G, P, Q, and in X, G, P, Q. So two squares. Let me just outline those for you in W, Q, P, G. There is one square. And then the other square will be G, P, Q, X, based on the fact that my two tangent theorem, I have a right angle here. Uh, I've established a right angle here. This is a tangent line, so X, Q is tan or perpendicular to P, Q. And again, a right angle here. Uh, again, P, G is going to be perpendicular to tangent wx. So I have two squares, each with a measure of side of 5. So I can determine 1, 2, 3, 4 lengths of uh, part of the quadrilateral wxyz. Now I'm going to say that qy is equal to y, and by the two tangent theorem, ym must be equal to y. And therefore, since yz is equal to 14, mz is going to be equal to yz, the entire length, minus ym or 14 minus y. And then again, by the two tangent theorem, uh, qz is going to be equal to 14 minus y. So I can figure out the length of qz, y, q. I don't know why they've given us two q's. Maybe I've, I've created a second q here. So we'll call this q primed. Um, so q primed z, y, q is going to be equal to 14 minus y plus 14 minus y plus y plus y. So 14 minus y plus 14 minus y plus y plus y. And if I simplify that, that leaves me with 28. So this distance here, which I'll identify now in black, q primed z m y q 
is going to be equal to 28. Well, I know that the second half, WQ, WG, GX, and XQ, this distance here is going to be 20. So 28 plus 20 leaves me with a perimeter of 48. All right, last problem. I know this is uh, tough and a little bit on the long side. Let's see if we can wrap this up quickly for you. A circle is inscribed in a triangle of sides 8, 10, and 12. So we'll identify this as the 8 unit side. This is going to be the 10 unit side. And then this uh, side on the upper right will be the 12 unit side. So I'm going to define this distance here as y and then this distance here as x as indicated by the question x plus y is equal to 8. So using the two tangent theorem again I can say that this uh, distance let's say from a to b is going to be x and then b to c is going to be 12 the entire length of ac minus ab which is 12 minus x. By the two tangent theorem I can say that cd is equal to 12 minus x again and then de is y and EF is Y. All right, so now we want to find out uh, the ratio of X to Y where X is going to be less than Y. So let's see if we can solve for X. So we know the perimeter of ABC is going to be 8 plus 10 plus 12. So 8 plus 10 plus 12 gives me 30. That's my perimeter. So 30 is going to be equal to 2X, 2X plus 2Y plus uh, 12 minus Y plus 12 minus Y. That gives me 2X plus 2y plus 24 minus 2y. And if I simplify that, I'm left only with uh, 6 is equal to 2x, or x is equal to 3. If x is equal to 3 and y plus x is equal to 8, then y must equal 5. And so the relationship of x to y is going to be 3 to 5, where x is going to be less than y. All right, that's it for Otten Math. Thank you very much for joining. I hope you were able to follow along. As always, remember, as we go through this, you can pause because sometimes I go pretty quickly through the problems. I want to try to keep this under 15 minutes for my students uh, so they can use this as a reference. But if you get caught, uh, just go back and replay and think about what's going on because sometimes these uh, problems take a little bit of time to digest. All right, so come and join us in the next edition of uh, Otten Math. We're going to talk about the power theorems in uh, circles. And uh, it's pretty exciting content. So uh, stay tuned in the next edition of Otten Math. Thanks for joining.